This is week three in our series on the subject of marriage. And if you didn't catch the first two sermons, then you need to watch them online because they laid the foundation for what I'm going to be teaching on this morning. In other words, each sermon builds on the previous sermon. Now, for those of you who were here and you heard the first two sermons, let me remind you of a few things before we just move on and start covering new material. In the first sermon, I gave you a very simple principle that relates to marriage. And this is the principle. The more screwed up you are, the more screwed up your marriage will be. The less screwed up you are, the less screwed up your marriage will be. I want you to notice that I use the words more and less, insinuating that everyone is screwed up to some degree. Some people are just screwed up more than others. But that's why everyone has problems in their marriage from time to time. It's because everyone is screwed up to some degree. The problem is we usually don't know that we're screwed up. In other words, we don't realize that we're dysfunctional or that we grew up in a dysfunctional family because we don't know any different. From our perspective, what we experience growing up is normal. As an example, some of you might yell at your kids and tell them to shut up. And you think that that's normal because that's what you grew up with. But people, that's not normal. That's abnormal. And if you're doing that, you have a dysfunctional home and you're dysfunctional. I know what some of you are thinking. Well, pastor, what do you do when you want your kids to be quiet? Well, you tell them, please be quiet. And if they don't be quiet, you tell them, if you don't be quiet, then I'm going to spank you. In fact, let me go a little bit further. It's not normal to yell at your children. In fact, let me give you a little tip. When your kids aren't doing what you want them to do and you're starting to get irritated, will you just bring the volume of your voice down even more? Let me tell you, the quieter my dad got, the more we listened. If we were in church and we were doing something we shouldn't do, and my dad leaned over and says, wait till we get home. Oh my gosh, we straightened up. But some of you get out in public, you're at Walmart, you're at, you're at uh, the grocery store, and you start yelling at your kids. Please, if you do that, don't wear a Cornerstone Fellowship t-shirt. <laughs> That's not what we do here, all right? I just want you to know that. Now, when you take two people who grew up in a dysfunctional home and you join them in marriage, what do you get? You get a dysfunctional marriage. And that's why I say, the more screwed up you are, the more screwed up your marriage will be. The less screwed up you are, the less screwed up your marriage will be. That's also why God doesn't fix marriages. I know that's a shock to many people. If you started coming the first time and you heard me say that, you probably got a little offended. Yes, God does fix marriages. No, God doesn't fix marriages. God fixes people. You see, your marriage isn't broken, you are. And if you want to have a healthy marriage, then you have to become healthy. Now, that's what we covered in week one. In week two, we found out that marriage was designed to be the type of relationship where a couple has the liberty to be totally open and honest with each other with nothing to hide. Turn to Genesis chapter 2, verses 24 and 25, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. It says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now, most men don't like reading the Bible until they get to verse number 25. And there's something about the word naked that just makes them pop up. But I want you to see that Adam and Eve were naked, and they were not ashamed. Now, this isn't saying that Adam and Eve were naked, and they weren't embarrassed. No. This means much, much more than that. You see, the word ashamed is translated from the Hebrew word bush, which means to feel shame in the sense of guilt as if you've done something wrong. It can also mean to feel completely worthless as a result of guilt. So what this is saying is that Adam and Eve were naked and they didn't feel guilty about it because they didn't have anything to hide. Now, to really understand the significance of this story, you need to realize that even though this story is literal, it's also allegorical in nature. In other words, it's literal in the sense that it really happened. There really was an Adam and Eve who really lived in the Garden of Eden. But it's also allegorical in that the events have symbolic meaning. Does that make sense? Good. So let's look at the symbolism. Adam and Eve's nakedness symbolizes openness and honesty. In essence, they had nothing to hide. There was nothing to feel guilty about. There was nothing to be ashamed of. But we also know what happened down the road. Adam and Eve sinned, and their innocence was shattered. And for the very first time, they experienced this feeling of guilt. This guilt over their sin brought shame and a sense of feeling worthless. And they'd never felt that way before. This was new to them. So they did what came natural, what's part of human nature. They tried to cover it up. 
because to remain open and exposed after what they had done was just too shameful. So they clothed themselves in order to hide their guilt. And people, that's human nature. When we sin we, and, and we do something that we're ashamed of, what do we do? We try to hide it. In other words, we try to cover it up because we don't want anyone to know about it. And sometimes it's not what's been done, or it's not what we've done, it's what someone's done to us. But it was sinful. So even though we weren't responsible, we still feel guilty and ashamed. We can even feel worthless. You see, for some reason, it's human nature to connect what we've done with who we are. But it's also human nature to connect what's happened to us with who we are. So if you were molested as a child, it's human nature to connect what happened to you with what you are as a person. And we do that subconsciously. So we end up carrying guilt and shame for something that's not even our fault. It's what someone did to us when we were young and too powerless to do anything about it or to actually stop it. But it still affects us. It still makes us feel dirty, tainted, and sometimes even worthless. So we hide those things. We don't just put clothing on. What we do is we keep those things secret, not just from other people, but also from our spouse. So we never really get to enjoy what a true marriage is all about. The liberty to be totally open and honest with each other with nothing to hide. Now, that's what we covered in, in week two. So let's move on, and let's talk about how marriage is supposed to change you as a person. And when I say change you, I mean for the better, not for worse. Now, listen to me. What I'm going to share with you this morning, if it was a college course, it would be an advanced level course. In other words, it would be in the 4,000s. And what that means is if you don't have a good marriage, much of this won't make sense because what this is intended to do is to show you how to go from a good marriage to a great marriage. Now, if you don't have a good marriage, I'm not saying this doesn't apply. You still need to learn this information because hopefully one day you're going to have a good marriage. But you don't want to stop there. You want to have a great marriage. And I'm going to share with you the secret this morning on how to have a great marriage. But for many of you, you're going to disagree with what I teach. Because to you, you just can't even, you, you can't even fathom that this is possible. All right? Everyone with me? Now, whenever I officiate a wedding ceremony right before the vows, I usually tell the couple that marriage is intended to join them for life in a relationship that is so intimate and so personal that it will change their whole being. And what I mean by that is that marriage has the ability to change the essence of who they are as a person. Now, it's meant to change a person in a good way, but sometimes it changes them in a bad way. In fact, how many of you have ever noticed that? You've noticed that when people get married that it changes them. Anyone ever notice that? Maybe they stop hanging out with their friends. Maybe it's because they're married now and all their friends are single and they realize, you know, I can't go to the places my single friends do. Maybe they become more responsible or maybe they become less responsible. Maybe you saw your children when they got married. They became more driven or maybe they were less motivated and they became less driven. Maybe they seemed happier when they got married or two or three months later they seemed not as happy. But one way or another, marriage changed them. Has anyone ever noticed that? That marriage changes a person one way or another? If you have, I want you to raise your hand. Anyone who knows that marriage changes a person? Yeah, it's true. It, it happens. Because marriage is a different type of relationship than any other relationship. And God intended it to change the essence of who you are as a person. Sometimes it changes you for the better. Sometimes it changes you for the worse. But it does change you one way or the other. Now, if you want to have a great marriage, and I don't just mean a good marriage, I mean a great marriage, then you need to learn a certain secret. You see, there's a lot of couples that have a good marriage, that have good marriages. But there are very few couples that have a great marriage. And the reason very few couples have a great marriage is because they don't know the secret to a great marriage. But I'm going to give you the secret this morning. And I'm going to give it to you in the form of a principle. And then I'm going to explain it because it's probably not going to make sense to you when I first give it to you. And then after I explain it, I'm also going to illustrate how it works and why it works. And hopefully it's going to make perfect sense to you. If it doesn't make perfect sense to you, that's okay. Still learn it. Put it on a shelf. Because one day, the light bulb is going to go on. It's going to click. And you're going to understand what I'm trying to teach you. So that you can have a great marriage instead of just a good marriage. So if you're taking notes, I want you to write this principle down. Or take a picture of it if you want. Here it is. Marriage is meant to change you, but only in a way that enhances who God created you to be. 
Let me say that again, because that's good. Marriage is meant to change you, but only in a way that enhances who God created you to be. In other words, marriage was never intended to change who God created you to be. Instead, it was meant to enhance who God created you to be. You see, according to Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 10, you were created in a specific way to do certain things for the glory of God. And marriage doesn't change what God created you to do. Look at that verse, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Notice what it says. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now notice that we were created to do good works. And not just any good works, but we were created to do specific works. So according to this scripture, before God ever created you, he already had certain things in mind that he wanted you to do. It says that he planned in advance the things he wanted you to do. Now think about this. Before an architect ever designs a building, there's two questions that he'll always ask his clients. Number one, what's the purpose of this building? And number two, how is this building going to be used? And the reason he asks those two questions is because the design of the building is based on its purpose and its use. In other words, the function determines the building's form. Well, believe it or not, God does the very same thing. Before a person is ever created, God decides what good works he wants them to do. And then he specifically creates that person to be able to do those things. He gives them specific gifts, talents, and abilities. But that's not all. He then, along with that, gives them a specific personality type, temperament, predominant love language, and even a specific work style, which means that every person that's here is unique, kind of like a snowflake. There's no two snowflakes just alike, right? Well, the same thing applies to people. There's no two people that are exactly alike, but we're unique for a specific reason. And according to Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 10, that reason is so we can accomplish the specific things that God has called us to do. You see, in many ways, I'm just like my dad. But in many ways, I'm different than my dad. Because no two people are just alike. We might say, well, you know, they're just alike. And what we mean by that is they're very similar in certain ways. But what we have to realize is that in reality, they're also very different in many ways. So the truth is no two people are just alike. But the reason we're all different is because we have different things that God wants us to accomplish. Now, marriage is not supposed to change who God created you to be. Instead, it's meant to enhance who God created you to be. And it doesn't change what God has called you to do. You know, when I got married, it didn't change that God had called me to be a pastor. I just wanted to make sure that I married someone who wanted to be a pastor's wife because we would have been in trouble if God had called me to be a pastor and I married someone who didn't want me to be a pastor because I understood something. Marriage was not supposed to change who God created me to be. It was only supposed to enhance that and it wasn't going to change what God had called me to do. Does that make sense? So let me say this again. Marriage is not supposed to change who God created you to be. Instead, it's meant to enhance who God created you to be. And it doesn't change what God has called you to do. The only problem is when we get married, it's only natural for our spouse to want to change us and for us to want to change our spouse. Yeah, it's true. When we get married, we start trying to change our spouse into the type of person we want them to be. And they start trying to change us into the person they want us to be. Right, women? You married a diamond in the rough, right? And if they'll just let you work on them, you'll make them sparkle. Right? Yeah. That's just human nature. You know, when we get married, the first thing we want to do is we want to start trying to change our spouse into the person that we want them to be. And they start trying to change us into the type of person they want us to be. In fact, you might not even be aware that you're doing that with your spouse, but the truth is you are. To be honest with you, everyone uses passive-aggressive behavior, subtle manipulation, and even emotional tactics to try and get their spouse to do what they want or to change into the type of person they want them to be. People, it's just part of the addict nature. I guarantee you, if you're honest, if we, had you to do a, uh, if we had you do a polygraph test and we said, have you ever tried to change your spouse? And you said, no, I'd want to crank it up where it shocks you. Because you'd be lying. 
Liar, liar, pants on fire. People, it's just part of the atomic nature. But listen to me. As much as we would like to believe that we only want our spouse's happiness, the truth is we do what we do to get what we want. Yeah. Let me say that again. As much as we'd like to believe that we only want our spouse's happiness, the truth is we do what we do to get what we want. And what we want is for our spouse to change in the type of person we want them to be. But that's counterproductive to creating a great marriage. In fact, it's the exact opposite of what a marriage was intended to do. Remember, marriage is meant to change you, but only in a way that enhances who God created you to be. In other words, marriage was never to, intended to change who God created you to be. Instead, it was meant to enhance who God created you to be. Now, let me give you a personal example to illustrate how we try to change our spouse into what we want them to be instead of what God wants them to be. And the reason I'm going to give you a personal example is because if I used you, you'd be offended. Yeah, let me give you an example of Mark Jordan trying to, to change Mandy Jordan. Mark, would that offend you? Mark goes, look at that. See, he mentioned me. I, he had to call me out. Yep, let me tell you a little story. Not just teasing. So I'm going to use myself as an example, and I want you to understand, I don't want you to get on Facebook and start poking at me. I don't want you to start poking at Lisa or writing things to my kids. I'm being honest, and if you start doing that, I'm going to start using you as an example. No, I'm just teasing, I won't. But let me show you, by using a personal example, how we try to change our spouse and the type of person we want them to be, and how that's counterproductive to creating a good marriage. Lisa's predominant motivational gift is serving. Everyone knows the difference between the motivational gifts and the manifestation gifts, right? The manifestation gifts are listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. They're called the manifestation gifts because Paul refers to them as manifestations of the Spirit. Now, those gifts that are listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 are supernatural gifts. They're the gifts such as prophecy, tongues and interpretation, Word of knowledge, word of wisdom, gifts of healings, the gift of miracles, etc. These gifts allow us to see or to experience the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in a supernatural way. Those are the manifestation gifts. They're as the Holy Spirit wills. We can't will ourselves to have these gifts and we don't determine when we operate in them. That's up to the Holy Spirit. They're manifestations of the Spirit. The motivational gifts are found in Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. These gifts are not supernatural in any way. In fact, these gifts are what we call inherent gifts. In other words, these are the gifts that you're born with. And it doesn't matter whether you're a Christian or not a Christian. You have one of these and possibly many of these gifts inside of you. Yeah, you were born with them. And even if you don't become a Christian, you'll always have that gift inside of you because you were born with these gifts. Now, the reason they're called the motivational gifts is because they motivate you to do certain things and to act in certain ways without even realizing it. These are the gifts such as serving, teaching, exhortation, giving, administration, etc. Now, Lisa's predominant motivational gift is serving my predominant motivational gift is teaching 99% yeah my second uh, secondary motivational gift is prophecy not the manifestation gift of prophecy but the motivational gift of prophecy which means you see things black and white 97% that's why I just say it the way it is because I have a choleric personality and my secondary motivational gift is prophecy. It's black or white. Yeah. But Lisa's the good person in the family. Her motivational gift is serving others, which means that she's just naturally motivated to serve others. And when she does, she gets a sense of great joy and fulfillment and she feels satisfied in her life. Her predominant love language is acts of service. Now, if you remember, there are five love languages. Words of affirmation, quality time, giving and receiving gifts, acts of service, and physical touch. Those are the five ways that you can communicate love in. 
And everyone has a predominant love language and a secondary love language. In other words, everyone has a predominant way in which they communicate love to others, and that's the way they want love communicated to them. And they have a secondary love language. Now, I'll just tell you mine, because I don't want to use anyone else. I am words of affirmation and physical touch. Now, if you start teaching on the love languages, every man will say that his predominant love language is physical touch because he's thinking of sex. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm physical touch, baby. No, you're not. How do I know that? Because if you take away the hormone testosterone, you don't want anything to do with touching. Oh, yeah. It's hormone-driven. This is not what this is talking about. This is the way that we communicate love. So if you take sex off the table, do you like holding hands? Do you like hugging? Do you ask your wife if you can cuddle with her? Cuddle? No. That's the part I don't like. You're not physical touch. Now, I'm words of affirmation. I'm not notes of affirmation, honey. See, my wife can't understand because I'm words of affirmation. That means I'm always telling them, boy, I appreciate you. You're doing such a great job. I love you or whatever it is. And so my wife thinks that this should translate into writing cards or writing notes, but it doesn't because I don't have the gift of writing. And because of that, I just want to say it. You see, I write kind of like the way I say. So my wife is always saying, well, you're words of affirmation. I don't know why you write, don't write cards. Honey, it's not notes of affirmation. It's words of affirmation. And that's just the way I am. You know, my girls grew up in a home where I was constantly telling them how much I loved them, that I was proud of them, what, how great they were, you know, they're beautiful. And, and I don't, it's kind of interesting, they're a different love language. But I hope that they got that. But see, because that's my love language, my mother's love language was words of affirmation. So my mother was always telling me how good-looking I was, how talented I was, what a good person I was, how proud she was of me. And you know what? I just felt so loved. And the reason I felt so loved is because that's my predominant love language. That's the way I communicate love to others. That's the way I like love communicated to me. Now, some of my siblings don't have that love language. As a result of that, maybe they didn't feel as quite as loved as I did. But that's what happens with love. Now, let's get back to my wife. My wife's predominant love language is what? Acts of service. Now, when Lisa and I got married, I loved the fact that her motivational gift was serving and that her predominant love language was acts of service because that meant that she likes to serve others and everyone knows I like to be served. <laughs> woo This is good. The only problem was I only wanted her to serve me. So I tried to change who God created her to be into what I wanted her to be, which was my personal servant. Now, don't judge me. <laughs> I wasn't making her do what she didn't like doing. Remember, her motivational gift is serving. So she likes to serve others. And she gets a sense of joy and fulfillment when she does that. I don't get it. I don't have that motivational gift. My girls don't have that. Lisa's kind of irritated that she's the only one in the family. So she's always serving us and we love being served. But anyways, I don't get it. But that's what she likes to do. It's what motivates her, and it's what brings her this great sense of joy and fulfillment. And that's also her predominant way of communicating love to others. So she likes serving others. The only problem was, I didn't want her to serve anyone but me. Now, I didn't come out and say that. No one ever comes out and says that. You're a fool if you came to your spouse and, you know, I'm trying to change you into what I want you to be. No one ever does that, no. Instead, I used... Passive-aggressive behavior, subtle manipulation, and emotional tactics to try and change her from what God wanted her to be into what I wanted her to be. And let me tell you, it created problems in our marriage. And I'll give you an example to illustrate how and why it created problems. Years ago, and I'm talking 30 to 35 years ago, we've been married for 37 years. Yeah. 37 years. Sometimes I tell some of the staff members, I've been married longer than you've been alive. 
But years ago, 30 to 35 years ago, there was a person who was going through a rough patch, and she also had a lot on her plate. So Lisa decided to bake her and her family a cheesecake because she knew that they liked cheesecake. Now, this was on a Saturday, and I could hear her as I was watching football. You see, my, one of my predominant motivational gifts is watching football. <laughs> it motivates me to do what I do and act the way that I act on a Saturday morning. And the only reason it's not written in the book of Romans chapter 12 is because they didn't have football back then. If they had, Paul would have included it. No, I'm just teasing. But anyways... <laughs> On Saturday morning, I I, I was watching football, and I heard Lisa banging in the kitchen, making something or baking something. And she loves to bake, so I knew, okay, she's baking something. And boy, did it smell good. So I walked into the kitchen. I asked her what she was baking, and she said, I'm baking a cheesecake, but it's not for us. It was for this person and their family. So I said, we don't get one? And she said, no. No. It's not for us. And she could tell that I was very disappointed. And I was also a little irritated that she didn't bake two cheesecakes. One for them and one for us. Because, hey, charity begins in the home, right? Yeah. Now, because of my attitude, I took most of the joy that she should have experienced away from her. Yeah. And, of course, I was irritated So nobody was happy. And it was kind of like that every time she did something for someone else. Someone other than me. So we came up with a compromise. Now, some of you think that it's good that we compromise, but the truth is that's why we had a good marriage and not a great marriage. Yes, some of you think that compromise is good. And sometimes it is good good because you have problems in your marriage and the only way you can get over it is to compromise and that takes you to a good marriage but compromise will never take you to a great marriage you see compromise means that neither one of us actually got what we really wanted instead it was give and take and sometimes that's the best you can do to make things work in a marriage But it's not God's best, and it won't give you the best marriage. You see, when you have marriage problems, before you decide to divide half of your your property up, you go to a marriage counselor, right? That's the last resort. You know, I'm going to go to a marriage counselor before we go to the lawyer. And the only reason you really do that is because you want to tell everyone, we tried counseling. Bull crap. You don't try counseling. You go to counseling and you do what they tell you to do. But when you have a bad marriage, you went to counseling and they told you to compromise. The reason they told you to compromise is because you have a bad marriage. And in order to get you a good marriage, you need to compromise, give and take. But I want you to understand, compromise is not ever the best. And it will not give you the best marriage. Now, in our case, I don't think you're getting it. Let me stop right here. Listen to me. I don't compromise with God. I don't compromise with God. I submit to his will. God doesn't come and say, you know, Alan, we've got this problem in this relationship with ours. Let's do a little give and take. Let's compromise. God doesn't do that. I either submit to his will or I don't. There's no compromise in the will of God. Compromise is not a bad thing when it comes to marriage because sometimes it's the best thing you can do in order to get in order to get you out of the problems you have into a good marriage. But it's never God's best. All right, that's another time. Now, in our case, Lisa didn't get to do the things for all the people she really wanted to do things for. She only got to do some of the things for some of the people she really wanted to do things for because we were compromising. And I wasn't the recipient of all of her acts of service, but I was the recipient of some of her acts of service because it was a compromise, right? Neither one of us really got what we really wanted. But one day, it was kind of like the light bulb went off. And I realized 
that I was keeping Lisa from being everything God wanted her to be. And I was keeping her from doing all of the things that God wanted her to do, all because I was selfish. You see, I wanted to change her into the type of person I wanted her to be instead of allowing her to be the type of person God wanted her to be. And when I realized that, I actually came to that conclusion. When I realized that, I repented. And I told my wife, I went to her and I said, you know, I'm going to apologize to you. I've always made you feel guilty when you did something for someone else and you didn't do it for me. And I finally come to the realization that I'm trying to change you into the type of person I want you to be and I'm not allowing you to be the type of person God wants you to be. And I want you to know I'm sorry. And from now on, whatever you want to do for others, you feel free and I'm not going to put guilt on you. And you know what? From that moment on, I watched my wife come alive. I saw her become what God intended her to be. I saw how she was blessing others and ministering to others. I saw the joy and fulfillment that she received by doing it. And it blessed me. It blessed me. And I'll be honest. I actually got more from her than when we compromised. Yeah. And our marriage went from being a good marriage to a great marriage. Now, you're probably looking at that one example and you say, well, I really don't know how to apply this. So I'm going to give you two more examples. And I'm going to use myself as the example because I don't want to offend anyone. And I'm not going to get offended by using myself. But I am being open and vulnerable and I'm showing you my faults. I'm being scriptural. Confess your faults one to another. So I'm doing that. Lisa's secondary love language is gift giving. In other words, one of the ways that she communicates love to others is by giving of gifts. And before we had children, it was okay. And I'll tell you why it was okay. Shortly after we got married, we just came into some wonderful opportunities. I've talked about this before. My father-in-law, who was a very successful man, wanted to retire. Cooey kind of had two families. Um, he had his sons, Mike and David, and then Maydeen had some health problems, and she was told she could never get pregnant again. And so there's nine years between David and Lisa, because Lisa is the miracle child. And from her, then she had two other sisters. But there was nine years difference between her and David and 11 years difference between her and Mike. So shortly after we got married, uh, Cooey wanted to retire. And he came to us and said, would you like to buy the jewelry stores? And so we did. It was a wonderful opportunity. I was also in two other businesses. And we were really doing quite well. And then God comes along and he calls me to the ministry. And overnight, we became poor. Because God told us to sell the, the businesses and he told us what to do with it, with the finances. And we were obedient to do what God said. But I had a tough time with God early on because when I went to the ministry, we started having children. And we had gone from making good money to not making hardly any money. And Christmas would come along and I had Micah Joy, and I had Macy Michelle, and I love Christmas because I love to give to my girls. No one else but my girls and my wife. It's not my predominant love language. Or even my secondary love language. But that's Lisa's secondary love language. And so she not only wanted to give gifts at Christmas to our daughters, but she also wanted to give a gift to each one of her siblings and to her nephews and nieces and she had bukus and nephews and nieces and I'm looking at this little bit of money and I didn't want her to give it I want to spend it all on my kids and we went round and round and we compromised and compromise is not God's best because neither one of us really got what we wanted but they would draw names and she would buy a few gifts and she would do that and I still didn't like it because I could have used that money for 
gifts for my kids. At least that's the way I saw it. But here's what's sad. I was keeping Lisa from being able to express love. And just like God did with me with her motivational gift, God came to me one Christmas and he said, you're wrong. You're trying to change your wife into the type of person you want her to be. And you're not allowing her to be the type of person I created her to be. And God spoke to me. He said, the reason you work, son, is so that she can do with your money what she wants. And from that moment on, I apologized to her. And let me tell you what it's always been in our house. I tell my girls this all the time. I don't work for me. I work for my family. I tell my wife this all the time. You can do anything you want with my money. Because I work for you. And I tell my girls, they're very appreciative. I buy them something. So, oh, Dad, you shouldn't do that. And here's what I'll tell them. Honey, I love to do that. You're why I work. I work to be able to do this for you. I don't care much about clothes. I like a nice home, but so does my wife, so we don't have to compromise on that. The truth of the matter is what I really value is books, and I have a library allowance as part of my salary, so voila, you buy me books to be able to read, to be able to do what I'm doing here. But anyways, I want you to understand something. When I went to Lisa and I said, honey, I'm sorry. I'm trying to change you into what I want you to be instead of being, from now on, you can use our money any way you want. Because I realized I was keeping her from being what God had created her to be. And can you imagine how frustrating that must have been for her? Not to be able to communicate love. Because what I was really doing was telling her, you can't show love to your siblings or to your nephews and nieces. Because that's the way she communicates love. It was easy for me to communicate love. I just looked at my siblings and said, Rodell, I love you, Carol. I love you, Doug. I love you. Yeah. I communicated love to them. I'm words of affirmation. But she can't communicate love that way. And here's what's interesting. When I began doing that, God started blessing us financially and also in our marriage. I began to realize that if I want to have a great marriage, I've got to allow my spouse to be what God created them to be and who God created them to be. Now, let me give you one more example, because I want to make sure you get this. And my wife said, they're not going to get it if you don't give them examples. The predominant love language of both of my daughters is quality time. So as an act of service, Lisa likes to have a mom-daughter weekend with them at least once a quarter. She calls it M&M weekends, Micah, Macy, and she's mom. So it's M&M weekends. But here's what's interesting. It kind of does away or takes away from her serving me. <laughs> and I like to be served. And the reason why is because she is an act of service, so she thinks everything through. She gets on Etsy and she's got to send invitations to them that are custom designed. And she sends that. And then she has to think about all the things they're going to do and how she's going to decorate uh, the room because she goes up early and she gets in their apartment. She decorates it. And then she has to figure out what they're going to do as activities and where they're going to eat to make everything special. Now, I don't mind. Be honest with you. I don't mind how much money she spends. It's not my money anyway, it's hers. What's hers is hers, and what's mine is hers. But anyways, <laughs> that's not what gets me. But, but the other thing is, I'm in love with my wife, and I love spending time with her. We work together seven days a week, 24 hours a day, and I still don't get enough time with her. So she leaves me for a weekend. It's kind of like the, my big fat Greek wedding. So you're going to leave me? And I'm all alone for a weekend. But you know, it gives me great joy to see her being what she's called to be and seeing her ministering to my daughters. So I allow that. And here's what's interesting. God has always been so good that he always blesses me when she does those weekends. So listen to me. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. A great marriage is when both partners have the liberty to be 
exactly who God created them to be, and they're encouraging each other to be the person God created them to be. People, that's a great marriage. That's a great marriage. You want to know why Lisa and I have a great marriage? Because she lets me be who God created me to be. And I allow her to be who God created her to be. I don't have to worry that when I get called out to do something as a pastor, that she's going to be upset. And she doesn't have to worry about me being upset because she's doing something for someone else. She's communicating love in this way or doing some type of act of service. And as a result of that, we have a great marriage. We now encourage each other to be everything that God created us to be. And that's what makes a great marriage. Now, I'm going to give you some homework. You might not know what your motivational gift is. You might not know what your love language is. You might not even know what personality type you are. You might, even not, you might not know what your work style is. The more you know about yourself, the more you can come to the con- the more you'll know what God wants you to do. So you need to know those things. So we have four tests on our website. We have the motivational gift test. We have the love language test. We have the personality test. And we have the work style test. Now, most of those will explain the results. On the personality test, you need to go a little bit deeper. Once you take the test, you need to find out what that means. We give a little basic thing there, but you need to find out because you need to know who you are. And then you need to have your spouse do that, and you need to talk about it. You need to know what your spouse's motivational gift is. You need to know what their love language is. You need to know what their personality type is. You need to know what their work style is. And you need to encourage them to be everything that God wants them to be. Don't try to change them to be the type of person you want them to be. Let me tell you what kills a marriage. It's when we get married and all of a sudden we realize it's very obvious that they don't like who we are and they're trying to change who we are. You shouldn't have married them if you don't like their personality. You shouldn't have married them if you don't like their predominant and secondary love language. You shouldn't have married them if you don't like their motivational gift or their work style. That's your fault. Now you need to come to grips with it with you and God instead of trying to change them to be what you want them to be. Now, Next week, we're going to do something a little different. Remember, each sermon in this series builds on it. Next week, we're going to talk about boundaries. Because what happens if you're married to a person and you want to do this, but they don't? Where do you draw the line? Where do you say, "Uh uh-uh? How do you create a healthy marriage? Well, you create a healthy marriage through boundaries. I'm going to show you from God's word the boundaries that you should have.